Welcome to the Circular Economy Show by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, where we explore the ins and outs of the circular economy with the help of key actors mobilizing it at scale. My name is Rob, and in today's episode, we'll be showing you why we need to move from voluntary initiatives and ambitions towards legally binding agreements and actions if we are to tackle some of our most pressing global challenges. And in this case, we'll be looking at plastic pollution. Here's a video to show more. You've just seen a short video showing the need for a legally binding agreement that transcends national borders to help us tackle a global challenge such as plastic pollution. Let me give you some context. Plastic pollution has been a growing problem for many years now, and we're finally starting to see some ways that we can tackle this global challenge. On the 28th of February, the United Nations Environment Assembly will meet in Nairobi, and governments have an unprecedented opportunity to start negotiating for a United Nations Treaty on Plastic Pollution. It's a chance to drive ambition towards action. We will be joined by the Worldwide Fund for Nature, who have been critical in helping us get to this point. We'll also be hearing from the government of Costa Rica, the Coca-Cola Company and Unilever, all of which have been supporting and calling for a UN Treaty. The UN Treaty is based on a circular economy approach. However, the challenges that we face go well beyond plastic pollution. Plastic pollution is only one of the global challenges we are currently facing. One way to view these challenges is the Planetary Boundaries Framework developed by a team including Johan Rockström, the director of the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. This framework presents nine planetary boundaries that represent the limits in which humanity can operate develop and thrive for generations to come. They include stratospheric ozone depletion, atmospheric aerosol loading, ocean acidification, nitrogen and phosphorus flows to the biosphere and oceans, freshwater consumption and the global hydrological cycle, land system change, loss of biosphere integrity or biodiversity loss and extinction, climate change and chemical pollution and the release of novel entities. As you can see, we have already overshot five planetary boundaries, and two are yet to be quantified. Seb edgerson reed from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation had a chance to speak to Johan Rockström at COP26 and asked him to tell us a bit more about his work and the current situation we are facing. Yeah, so the planetary boundaries is, a, is an Earth system science approach to try and identify the, the big processes like the climate system, biodiversity, the nitrogen cycle, water cycle, that scientifically we know regulates the state of the planet. And for each of these systems, each of these planetary boundaries define a scientific target or boundary level within which we get a safe operating space. We have a high likelihood of remaining on a stable, resilient planet, but beyond which we start having risks of crossing tipping points and triggering irreversible changes that would you know, make us drift away from a state of the planet that can really support humanity as we wish. So it's a, it's a guide for sustainability in the Anthropocene. And when you first published this research um, quite some time ago, a couple of those boundaries are being tipped, but more recently, the picture is sort of less promising. Mm. Yes, we published the Planetary Boundary Science the first time in 2009. We already then, then actually uh, concluded that the planetary climate boundary is uh, slightly below 1.5 degrees Celsius, but very close to to what we, in the end, you know, six years later, agreed in Paris. So we had already, you know, scientific evidence has been around at least for, you know, better part of 10, 15 years that cross, you, you, you come beyond a 1.5 point, we start coming into a danger zone in terms of risks of triggering 
or crossing tipping points. But the most important, I would argue, with the planetary boundary science is that it shows that we have to have a net zero loss of, of biodiversity because if you lose ecological functions in the living ecosystems, you lose uh, carbon sink capacities, you lose carbon stocks, you lose moisture feedback, you lose many of the ecosystem functions that, that we as humans depend on for our own livelihoods. So the planetary boundary uh, results already at the 2009 paper show that four of the nine boundaries were you know, transgressed. So this is climate, obviously, but also biodiversity, nitrogen and phosphorus, and, and land system change. And land system change is really dramatic because that's the boundary, you know, how much of intact forests are we able to keep in order to serve humanity and, and stability in the planet. Now, we know that by losing more forests, we also risk having impacts on the climate boundary. So, so the, the insight scientifically is that they're all interconnected. So if you go into the red on biodiversity, nitrogen and land, you're very likely to have feedbacks that makes it more difficult for us to meet the climate boundary. So it's like all for one, one for all. It's, yeah. a, it's a three musketeers approach to the planetary boundary. Now, it's not all bad news because I just heard you on stage, you're here at the New York Times Climate Hub in Glasgow, say that actually purely on a biological, physical sense, it's completely achievable for us to hit the 1.5 degree target to get within the planetary boundaries. The challenge is actually more social and economic. Well, I, I like your interpretation of completely feasible. <laughs> um, that sounds like it's a it's an easy ride. It is not an easy ride. Uh, what I said is really that it's it's still from from a pure natural science perspective still possible uh, if we can keep the resilience in our living biosphere intact on land and in the ocean, and if we can decarbonize according to what I call the carbon law, which is cut emissions by half every decade, reach a zero point in 30 years time, then scientifically. Uh, what we know today, it's still possible. The drama is that it doesn't look so probable given the, the political situation in the world that we're not, not bending the curves fast enough. So you're right, it's a, one has to be clear that, I, I would conclude like this, it's necessary to aim as close as possible to 1.5. It's still possible, the window is still open, but, but barely. Is it probable? Do we, do we see signs of leadership that would take us to that safe landing zone? For the moment, the answer is no. And that's why we need to ramp up the, the speed of that transition. So it's possible, but not yet probable, to stay within the planetary boundaries. How can we change our direction to stay within the planetary boundaries? One way may be the circular economy. It aims to create a regenerative economy that eliminates waste and pollution, circulates products and materials, and regenerates nature. By redesigning how we make and use everything around us with a circular economy mindset, we can help tackle climate change and biodiversity loss, therefore contributing to address many other challenges and go back within the planetary boundaries. As Johan mentioned, we are lacking signs of leadership and action. Since that conversation took place a few months ago, another planetary boundary has been crossed. Chemical pollution caused primarily by plastic production. What do some of these signs of leadership and action look like? And how can a circular economy really help us address plastic pollution? Ellen MacArthur gives us a one minute overview of some of the actions that we urgently need. Millions of dollars are being spent on cleaning up beaches, rivers, streets, recycling. But it's not enough, because all that will be in vain if we continue to pour plastic packaging which has no value into the economy. We need to tackle this flood at source. We need to go to the beginning of the system so every piece of plastic that is manufactured has a value. We need to eliminate all the plastic we don't need. We need to innovate for the plastic we do, making sure it is reusable, recyclable and compostable. And importantly, we need to circulate everything we produce, be that plastic or a biological component which replaces it. That's what sits behind the global commitment. This is the vision of the new Plastics Economy Global Commitment and this is the vision that over 450 organisations, including some of the biggest companies in the world, 
countries, regions have signed up to. We've already seen significant action and these include reducing the amount of virgin plastics which enter the global economy, radical innovation in the way businesses operate and provide solutions to their customers, and billions of dollars that have been committed to increase the use of recycled plastic around the world, keeping it in the economy and out of the ocean. But we need to raise our level of ambition and match it with bold and urgent action to accelerate the transition to a circular economy for plastics. Through the global commitment, governments and businesses have united behind this vision and the 2025 targets for a circular economy for plastics. These initiatives have laid the foundations for wide-reaching voluntary cooperation, but we need to go much further. We need an international legally binding agreement that amplifies current efforts and levels the playing field to deliver industry scale change and end plastic pollution. But before we dive into how an international treaty can help us fix plastic pollution, let's take a step back and ask what is a treaty? Here's my colleague Laura Franco Henel to explain. What is a treaty? Well, there are very different definitions of what a treaty is. But according to the Vienna Convention on the Laws of Treaties, a treaty means an international agreement concluded by member states in written form and governed by international law. So what does this mean? Well, in this case, we are talking about a United Nations Treaty. This means that government representatives from member states of the United Nations have to negotiate and agree um, what kind of uh, treaty they want, what its content is, and how it will be implemented and enforced. So why is a UN treaty the right approach to solve a global challenge? Well, first, it builds on the success and learnings from voluntary agreements and it can bring this success to scale. Second, it ensures a level playing field for all countries and the direction that they have to aim for. It basically means that all countries are on the same page and following the same rules. And third, it provides the framework for global aligned efforts to tackle an environmental challenge, for example, plastic pollution. It is a global solution for a global problem. The United Nations Environment Assembly offers the opportunity to negotiate a UN treaty on plastic pollution. There is a lot of momentum behind this treaty, with over 2 million people, over 700 civil society groups and over 70 global businesses all calling for and supporting this treaty. Eric Lindenberg, the Global Plastics Policy Manager at the World Wildlife Fund, offered his insights with us. Here is a conversation between Eric and Laura. Laura asked Eric why we need this kind of legally binding agreement to help address plastic pollution. Plastic pollution is in many aspects a global problem. The consequences are global. Uh, once plastic is out in the oceans, then it's crossing borders and it's uh, polluting our global commons of the ocean. Uh, it is global in the sense that plastic products are traded across borders, plastic waste is traded across borders, and the production of uh, plastic is, is often happening in countries, uh, way different countries than where the plastic ends up uh, finally. So uh, the, the, the value chain and the life cycle of a plastic product uh, crosses a lot of borders. That means that uh, regulation in those uh, different uh, countries that the, the product uh, stays in are harmonized and the same and that there is a, there is a common approach in all those countries to solve uh, this problem. For example, you could imagine a design standards for one product to make sure that it can be safely recycled and managed in another uh, country to, to where it was produced. Or another example, if you ban uh, an unnecessary single-use plastic product in one country, but not in any of the neighboring countries, then they, that creates large problems uh, of, uh, of uh, smuggling and illegal trade and lowers the effect of, uh, of that ban in one country. 
And I think the final aspect is also for the industry. It's a, it's a global industry, right? And uh, for the industry to to uh, really uh, go through the necessary transformation at the global scale, then it's important to have one approach and, and, and one common set of rules across countries to relate to. Uh, that makes it both more easier and more efficient to, uh, to solve the problem in practical terms. What would a successful UN treaty uh, look like? A successful UN treaty would have ambitious goals on the one side, so it will clearly uh, put everyone in a common direction towards reducing plastic pollution to zero uh, uh, in the longer run, uh, then it will have will be ambitious not only in the goal, but also in the measures. And I think we've seen uh, uh, way too many global environmental agreements that are very ambitious in the goals, but not ambitious when it comes to the measures uh, to solving them. So, so it's really important that Uh, uh, there's a clear link between the measures and the goals. That means that we uh, need global definitions, global standards for product products and product design for material use, um, that we have uh, uh, global regulations, bans on some products that uh, are unnecessary, um, and that this set of Uh, rules and regulations are then supported by um, by a, a proper institutional uh, framework around it uh, with COPs, with uh, a scientific panel and importantly with a, a financial mechanism that can support implementation of uh, these obligations in all countries. Um, so, I'm, I mean, I'm hearing... Um establishing uh, global standards, uh, supporting, I guess, all countries to, to do this, like with, with tools, with knowledge. Um, and in a way as well, we also have to consider how this new economy would look like, right? And here is where the circular economy comes into play and, you know, asks you to look at the source of the problem instead of just dealing with it at the end. Um, In your opinion, what role does the circular economy play in that future vision that the UN treaty kind of wants to, to create uh, in the world? I think the circular economy plays a central role, uh, really. We need a global circular economy. That's why we need global laws, global regulations through a treaty. Um, and in order to stop the current situation, which is really just producing virgin plastics, uh, using it for a very short amount of time and, and creating a huge waste problem at, at the other end of that linear economy that we currently have. If we are to reach a goal uh, or get as close as we possibly can to the goal of zero plastic pollution, so that what, that's what we really have to, from the nature and environmental side, Plastic doesn't disappear in the environment. So any plastic that we uh, release will stay there and accumulate. So we really, we have a finite planet. We really have to get to zero plastic pollution. And the only way then that we can still uh, use uh, plastics uh, in, for the areas where plastics is really needed is through a circular economy. So uh, I think it, there are important arguments for for reduction, for reducing uh, production and consumption uh, of plastics, and then create a true circular economy for for what is then left um, in circulation. I, I mean, I think it's clear that that the world uh, in many ways or the many parts of the society are supporting this uh, UN treaty with more than two million people. And well, you just told me that actually it's more than 900 civil society groups Uh, from a, a huge new number of countries that are calling for governments to to sign this global legally binding um, agreement to end plastic pollution. And we've also seen a clear push from the business and financial sector with around 70 business and financial institutions also uh, signing a pre-UNEA um, statement asking governments to 
start negotiations for the UN Treaty. Um, a lot of the 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 businesses, the uh, a lot of the businesses that we speak to, a lot of the businesses that are you know pushing for a circular economy for plastics that are heavily in, you know in favor of getting the UN um, treaty, they have goals set for 2040, 2050, um, which seem a bit far away. You could almost like you know say, well, what are your plans today? Uh, you know, how, uh, you know, it's very clear what, where you want to be in 2040 and 2050, and that sends a very clear message to, to people, but also how are you going to turn your ambitions into actions? Um, I just wanted to discuss this a little bit with you because you mentioned uh, measures and you mentioned tracking. Is that the, what we need more of? Do we need to, you know, have this kind of metric system that, you know, will help? hold them accountable? Or is there more to it that we need to be asking businesses to do? I think that's definitely one of the, uh, the measures that needs to be put in place. Today, plastic pollution isn't really uh, well measured, uh, neither at the business level, uh, nor at the country level, or global level. A lot of our understanding of plastic pollution and the levels of plastic pollution comes from uh, scientific estimates, research on how much plastic is in the ocean, etc. That really has to change. We need to start tackling plastic pollution as a, a concrete uh, uh, problem of emissions that we can actually quantify and that we should report on. Uh, a treaty will hopefully put in place a, a global reporting system and set some uh, global standards on on methods for reporting so that they can be comparable uh, across countries. Uh, so measuring really the plastic footprint and, and measuring the level of circularity also within a business uh, is key. I think it is a danger uh, when you see companies that only commit to something that is far into the future, very distant into the future, and don't have a clear plan uh, and a clear way of measuring progress towards that goal. Um, so all those things need to be put in place. It's great to see that many businesses are making commitments, uh, uh, but then we're looking even more forward to see them reporting in, uh, in approaching those commitments. Now let's turn to hear how governments and businesses are hoping to utilise this treaty to tackle plastic pollution. We had a conversation with Rolando Castro Cordoba, the Vice Minister for Environment and Energy at Costa Rica. We asked Rolando why Costa Rica supported this treaty and what they hoped would happen to plastic pollution as a result. Well, the, the topic or one of the topics of this conversation is, of course, how we can address plastic pollution. And, and we are discussing here the need to move from voluntary agreements to illegally binding actions. And I would like to, to ask to hear a bit more about the context of Costa Rica and plastic pollution. Uh, because, of course, it's a global issue. It has it goes beyond borders, affecting, well, all countries, but certainly some countries more than others. Um, was there a particular motivation by Costa Rica to support this from the very beginning? Yes, well, Costa Rica, like many countries, especially developing countries, has um, a problem with solid waste management and especially with plastic pollution. Uh, we live in the tropics, and uh, so this affects, you know, our rivers, our shores, the oceans, and also we have a large coast on both oceans. So we also get, you know, ocean pollutions from elsewhere. And I think this is um, quite a, a problem for us. And this is why we need to take local actions, but also uh, global actions are needed. And I, I think, Rolando, uh, one of the questions I certainly have is, um, in the case of Costa Rica, how would this treaty help you, um, you know, as a nation, as a country, address, glo address plastic pollution? 
Well, I think uh, Costa Rica is a small country with no army. So we rely on multilateralism, multilateralism, sorry. And uh, so we are always supportive of the international treaties, international law, rule of law. And I think this treaty could be a great opportunity to have a, a regulation that is uh, binding to all the countries, to all the industries that, you know, the, the industrialized world won't uh, be uh, banning products, but sending them to the developing world. And I think it's important also that a treaty like this will put circular economy as, the, as an important approach to solve a global problem such as plastic pollution. We've just heard the Costa Rican government's perspective. Now let's hear the business perspective from the Coca-Cola company and Unilever. A UN treaty for plastic pollution has been backed by over 70 global businesses and financial organizations who are calling on United Nations member states to commit to the development of a global treaty on plastic pollution. Big businesses have been a major player in their linear economy, contributing to global plastic pollution. Now they are recognizing that they have a role in their global effort to stop plastic pollution, and they are committed to tackling this issue. In recent years, businesses have set concrete targets to achieve a circular economy for plastics, through the New Plastics Economy Global Commitment and Plastic Packs. But this alone isn't enough. A coordinated international response that aligns businesses and governments behind a shared understanding of the causes of plastic pollution and a clear approach to addressing them is needed. A UN treaty on plastic pollution can help businesses drive the transition to a circular economy for plastic by harmonising regulatory standards, mandating the development of national targets and action plans, defining common metrics and methodologies, and supporting innovation and infrastructure development. Let's hear from two business leaders backing the development of a UN treaty on plastic pollution. Up first is B. Perez, the Chief Communications, Sustainability and Strategic Partnerships Officer at the Coca-Cola Company. And then we'll hear from Pablo Costa, Vice President of Packaging at Unilever. And so for us, it's about how do you inspire by putting these statements forward? and working through collective action to drive that change. And so that's why we signed up because we believe in it. We know that we have proof points that it works and it can make a difference. And then how do we inspire everyone to work together, to align and to do this in a common way to drive scalable change? Well, um, we are part of 70 companies, uh, actually, that we have signed up uh, for it, supporting uh, a Plastic Global Treaty, uh, through the United Nations. Uh, and the main reason, Seb, is because we need a level playing field for this. Yeah, We need to ensure we all play uh, with the same rules. That is, we are supportive of it, and that's why we believe that that treaty, it should be uh, legally binding. It's very, very important. It is legally binding, so there's no way around, around this. And the second element for the treaty will be, uh, we have to ensure that we'll drive reduction in the amount of virgin plastic uh, is produced to force the system to start moving into a more circular uh, system. So the business imperative is clear. Businesses must work together to solve the problem of plastic pollution. There is no time to waste. The UN Treaty for Plastic Pollution offers an opportunity to tackle plastic pollution through an international, legally binding agreement that builds upon the success of the voluntary agreements already in place. There is unanimous support for this treaty. The time to act is now. If you would like to find out more information, please head over to the Ellen MacArthur Foundation's website and take a look for the white paper titled A New UN Treaty to Address Plastic Pollution or head over to unplasticstreaty.org. That's all for this episode. We hope you've enjoyed it. If you have, please do like and share it with your network or subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on LinkedIn and Facebook. That way, you'll be notified every time we broadcast. Thank you for watching and we look forward to seeing you in the next episode.